Okay, it's, it's one minute after noon here in beautiful Manoa Valley in Honolulu. Today's weather is somewhat cloudy, but pretty nice compared to uh, New England and New York today. I hope that you're having a snow day and you're snugged in at home participating in our very tropical uh, Fundamentals of Project-Based Language Learning Online Institute. This is day one out of five uh, live sessions since you joined the cohort that is doing all of this together you're live uh, with all of us and uh, we're going to take you through a couple of what we're calling lessons uh, today we're going to cover three different topics each one will uh, be presented for about 20 minutes and then we'll have question and answer about that topic and then we'll pass the baton to the next presenter uh, I'm the first person to go. Before I start, uh, I'd like to do a little housekeeping. Just to remind you, uh, our communication today is taking place in the text chat window. If you have anything that you would like to raise or to ask, just uh, use that chat window. You access the chat window by moving your mouse up toward the green bar at the top middle of your screen and clicking once on the speech balloon there that says chat. When the chat window floats uh, over the other things on your screen, then you can click in that bottom box and type your question or your comment and make sure that it says send to all participants so that we all see everything. Now, since you're here, I think you've already been through the introduction lesson, uh, which is on a separate website from this. Uh, it's a series of activities that you're going to work through yourself, right? So you already did the introduction lesson. You know that we go through several stages in that. We give you uh, something to consider, which is going to be a video. And then we take you through several steps, quizzing you, asking you to read a little bit more detail, and then asking you to participate in a conversation, a text-based conversation. And then finally, we're going to ask you to do what you might call homework. Uh, I'm not going to tour you through that right now, but I want to say my presentation today is basically an expanded version of the video that I'm going to put up there later for lesson one. So when you go back to lesson one after today's uh, presentation, it's going to seem very familiar. When you watch that short video, it's just a recap of this content that I'm going to cover today. There's not much difference between what I'm going to say today and what you'll see there. Okay, so um, today's topic, lesson one, what is PBL? What is project-based learning? What are its essential features? This website that's showing on screen right now is from the Buck Institute for Education. It's uh, you might say the premier authority or one of the premier authorities on the practice of project-based learning in education in the United States pre-K through 16. A lot of their material is geared toward K through 12 teachers and they have a wealth of resources at their website bie.org. Project-based learning basically starts uh, from the end. In other words, you're going to think about uh, some impact that your students can have on the world in, with a public audience and then think backwards from there to how your students can get to that place through all the complex tasks and everything that will be required to get them to the place where they can make this public event, making a connection with the public audience. I'm going to first talk about an example of a project, show you a few visuals, and then take you through eight essential features of project-based learning. Here we're seeing a photo from a park in Chula Vista, California, uh, which is the location of High Tech High. At High Tech High, project-based learning is pretty much their bread and butter. Their curricula are designed using PBL principles. This project that you're seeing the end result of was, is, it centers around the Mexican Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos. This project uh, resulted in this public event at which students displayed these traditional altars. 
they hosted uh, booths where people could uh, paint candy skulls or they could uh, uh, listen to dramatic storytellings in costume uh, and there were various kinds of other events that they did and uh, they they planned this whole thing using these eight essential principles that I'm going to address now the first principle is significant content at its core, the project is focused on teaching students important knowledge and skills derived from standards and key concepts at the heart of academic subjects. These eight essentials that I'm briefly describing to you now are at this page, bie.org, that you see on the screen. So for the Dia de los Muertos project, Dia de los Muertos, or the Day of the Dead in Mexico, is a culturally very significant event that many people in Mexico participate in in one way or another and invest with a lot of significance. So even though Americans know that there is this thing Dia de los Muertos, they might not realize that it's, it's highly significant to people in Mexico and is a way for them to, to process uh, memories about people who have passed on, to recognize the significance that those people had in their lives. And so, in that sense, the content Dia de los Muertos is very significant. In another sense, from the language point of view, because we're talking about a Spanish class here, the content that they covered is significant because as the project was planned, it was linked to standards, national standards such as ACTFL's world readiness standards, and all the ways that we describe language use, including ACTFL's five C's. If those descriptors are used, if, if in the planning of the project you use those as a referent, then that also counts as significant content because what you're doing, you are linking to something that people all over the country are doing. The second principle is a need to know. Students see the need to gain knowledge understand concepts and apply skills in order to answer the driving question, but more about that in a minute, and to create project products, beginning with an entry event that generates interest and curiosity. So for every project, there's an entry event of some kind. So what that means is the teacher thinks of a way that he or she can bring in something to the classroom, an artifact, a person, maybe some kind of media that will excite student interest in the topic and bring home to the students the significance of the topic and its relationship to the students own lives. The third principle that we want to address is a driving question which was referred to back in the in the a need to know. So this driving question is presented to the students project work is focused by an open-ended question that students understand and find intriguing, which capture, captures their task or frames their exploration. So in the case of Dia de los Muertos, their driving question was very, very open. Uh, it was, how can students develop authentic projects that provide cultural opportunities for the larger community? You'll notice that this driving question is so general it doesn't even refer to Dia de los Muertos in particular. Rather, it's just using Dia de los Muertos as, and uh, number one, because it's authentic in the in the target culture of Spanish language, it's, it's a real thing. And also, it's just one of many possibilities that they could have exploited to put together this kind of event. They could have chosen a different theme on the same driving question. As it happened, they focused on Dia de los Muertos. The fourth principle is student voice and choice. Students are allowed to make some choices about the products to be created, how they work, in other words, how the students do their work, and how they use their time, guided by the teacher and depending on age level and PBL experience. So um, I'd like to point out that this doesn't mean that the project is entirely 
guided and structured by the students themselves, rather that the framework that the teacher provides for the students is open enough, loose enough, that within it, students can make choices about the work that they will do. For example, if you had a project that involved the creation of media or the creation of a website, there are different parts to that media, different parts to the website that are going to require a division of labor. Some parts of it have to do with the technical part of putting things on the web, and some parts of it have to do with the content. Students might, in fact, have very different roles in the project depending on, on the choice that they make. If they're more inclined to go to the technical side, then you can give them that opportunity. All right. The next principle is 21st century competencies. Students build competencies valuable for today's world, such as problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity or innovation, which are explicitly taught and assessed. That last phrase, explicitly taught and assessed, is really important because as you go to plan a project, you want to make sure that you have pieces that address problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, and so forth. So you wouldn't want to design a project, for example, in, we, in which each student worked alone to make one small piece and then never interacted with the other students to synthesize, put them together. If you had a project where at the end each student stood up and said their own thing, then you would not be fulfilling 21st century competencies because collaboration, the working together to produce the project is viewed as a really important element of the training. So um, as far as Dia, Dia de los Muertos, the project goes, uh, there, it, at the High Tech High website, there is evidence that this project was pretty complex because uh, if uh, you dig down into the website, you can see the bits and pieces that the uh, Spanish teacher had the students do that built up the project. Uh, so it, you can see that students were doing this collaboration and communication. The sixth principle is in-depth inquiry. Students are engaged in an extended, rigorous process of asking questions, using resources, and developing answers. So rather than merely finding out about something, finding out the basic facts about something, students are trying to drill down into the reasons why these things are. So for example, they might, they might contrast one phenomenon with another, or they might they might adopt a critical approach. Uh, also, they're using resources and developing answers. That means students are going to go out and do some of their own research. They're going to search for things on the web, in the library. Maybe they are actually going out in the field and doing field work, observations of natural phenomena, interviews with native speakers. These are part of in-depth inquiry. The seventh principle is critique and revision. The project includes processes for students to give and receive feedback on the quality of their work, leading them to make revisions or conduct further inquiry. Typically in a project, there will be several uh, landmark points in the, the development, in the, in the process of development that the teacher will designate as times to sit down and trade some critique with the idea that the critique will feed into revision. So this is a cyclical process. It's an iterative process. Uh, a project isn't just done once and then finished. It involves this revision. So uh, in, uh, in the Dia de los Muertos project, uh, they used something called the Critical Friends Protocol which is uh, for part of the project plan that certain students had come up with. They sat those students down and then went through a process which is designed to be non-face-threatening. Uh, you know, it's not going to make them feel bad, but rather it's going to give them some useful information, things that they might think about that they could change in their project. 
finally, the eighth essential feature is a public audience. This is really important to think about because you must go beyond the walls of your institution if you're going to do rigorous project-based learning. So as language teachers and learners, we'll often try to think of some gap in the community where uh, maybe a problem exists because there aren't enough language resources. Here in Hawaii, for example, the fourth year Chinese curriculum is in the process of trying to incorporate a service learning element to have the students plan and develop Chinese language resources for travelers coming to the Honolulu airport. And they're, portner, they're partnering with the airport authority to uh, do needs analysis and figure out those kinds of language resources that they're going to need. Those resources will be useful to this entire population of Chinese travelers beyond the classroom. Uh, and I think this means more than the students present to their parents. All right, so uh, I've taken you through some of the, the essential features of PBL, and now I'd like to uh, field some of the questions that are raised uh, in, in the chat. So I'd like to invite my co-presenters uh, to select uh, a question and read it out, and I will try to deal with it. While we're waiting for that to happen, uh, I'd like to just put something out there. We're not bringing something to you that is 100% uh, uh, written and developed. Rather, our idea is that we're working with all of you as a group to shape ourselves what PBL, and especially PBLL, project-based language learning, can look like there is no fully developed roadmap for project-based language learning. That's not to say that people haven't tried it already, but it's not like there's one recipe for PBLL. We are co-constructing what PBL, PBLL is. All right, so uh, yeah. uh, I'm waiting to hear from okay. Jim. OK, can you hear me? Uh, the first question is, do all projects have to be group work? Uh, I think that uh, project, yes, has to involve group work because necessarily a project involves collaboration. Parts of the project might involve individual preparation by a student, but the purpose of that individual preparation is to do one piece that they're then going to synthesize, put together with products from other students to make a larger whole. It wouldn't be possible for a project to consist merely of individual student projects presented at the end. That would not fulfill PBL, and the, the, the conditions of rigorous PBL. Okay. The next question is, is PBLL limited to upper level students? Or are certain parts of the projects necessarily going to have to be in the native rather than the target language? This seems like a hard balance between utilizing meaningful language and teaching meaningful concepts. Yes, this question uh, hits on one of the most difficult points in bringing the concepts that we see in project-based learning into the world of language teaching and learning because in uh, project-based learning, it's assumed that the students are working in their native language or rather maybe the language of the classroom. Now we should remember that in most classrooms, not every student is a native speaker of the language of that classroom. And so you're going to have a spectrum of student ability to deal linguistically with sophisticated concepts uh, criticism, analysis, all those things that are part of rigorous PBL. And uh, we might gain some help from thinking about strategies that teachers use in single language classrooms to deal with students of limited proficiency in that language. If we can find how they deal with that in 
PBL classrooms in general, then we might be able to borrow some of those concepts and bring them into PBLL. But mostly, I think, it's a question of scaffolding. Yes, you probably would be hard-pressed to operate a PBLL classroom entirely in the target language because you would spend so much time trying to make the complexities of the project comprehensible to your students that you wouldn't have any time left to do the project itself. So there's going to have to be some, probably some judicious use of the student's L1 and also a clear definition of the times when it's okay to use the L1 and the times when you want to definitely use the L2. Now, um, I'll, we're going to deal with this question in much more detail in the later lessons, but I will simply comment that I'm, I really appreciate you raising this issue because that means you're really aware of the importance of comprehensible input in the language classroom and using the target language to the extent, the greatest extent possible. And I totally agree with that. Next question. Uh, are there FERPA or student privacy concerns to a public audience? How is that usually managed? Now, uh, I teach at university, and so my situation, I don't have as much experience with those uh, information restrictions that apply to K through 12 students, but uh, definitely, I don't think that FERPA would preclude. If we look at the Dia de los Muertos project and we see that the students were conducting this public event, they were uh, putting up the altars, they were acting, none of those things uh, in itself would pose uh, a privacy issue with regard to the students. Uh, after all, we have school assemblies where students put on plays, concerts. That's really uh, a similar issue. Uh, if it were something more like students sharing personal stories, sharing stories about their families, things like that, um, yeah, I think it, it's important to be sensitive to that, but we shouldn't uh, get the idea that we have to be super restrictive because of, of FERPA. Next question. Uh, is it difficult to implement the eighth step of PBLL without incorporating a, quote, service learning, unquote, element uh, without a community partner like the airport in the example you gave? Is it possible or is PBLL one version of service learning? Yes, uh, I'd like to address that. PBL does not necessarily include service learning component. Uh, a lot of the time, a project will be uh, a kind of artistic expression. So the students might address an issue in the world, and the way that they make a difference about that issue is by expressing their, uh, uh, their own attitudes and their own, say, suggestions for the way to change that thing in some kind of a public forum, like uh, a performance that's open to the public or uh, a product that they put on the web. They don't necessarily have to provide a service to a target population uh, in the sense of uh, making texts for that population to use or, uh, you know, going to um, a community organization to provide some kind of service. So it can be service it can involve service learning or it can not involve service learning. Okay, the next question, whose idea is the project, the students or the instructor? Uh, in in most cases, uh, I think that the instructor has the idea first. And, and brings the, the idea to the students in an entry event. However, uh, I think it's also entirely possible to develop a project from strictly from the student's own interests uh, and or to lay out a topic in very, very general terms and then ask the students what their interests are. So uh, in, in that way, maybe the, before the what we call the entry event, the teacher might seek input from the students on what they're interested in doing 
and then develop the entry event based on the interests that the students have expressed initially. The, the entry event and the driving question do not have to be developed independently by the teacher. The teacher can seek student input on developing those things as far as I know. I'm seeing in the chat now that um, there's more discussion about FERPA. Uh, Yao Hill has explained that the idea with FERPA is that we're not disclosing student academic records and confidential information without their consent. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, those things, I think uh, when it comes down to, for example, peer critiquing or uh, in an open environment, having students do self-critiquing, that might be the place where uh, we would bump up against FERPA because uh, students uh, are not supposed to know information about one another's grades, for example, their, their academic record. Um, yet here we are in an environment where students are working very collaboratively and they can see that maybe some people are uh, being more active and some are being less active and they have this idea of oh, that person is achieving more than the other person. But if you think about it, you think about a more traditional classroom setting, those issues are still there. And I think as long as the terms of FERPA are not violated explicitly, for example, you know, uh, Susie got an A and Johnny got a C, um, then it's okay. Uh, the skill of self-critiquing and providing feedback for colleagues is something that, it's a 21st century skill. It's something that all of us need in the workplace uh, and in, in life in general. And so uh, it needs to be part of PBL. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, can the real audience be other language learners in the same school or university? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, let's, let's put it this way. In rigorous PBL, the, the audience is supposed to be outside the walls of the school. The idea is to connect what students are learning with the outside world and involve them in real time in questions and problems that exist in the community beyond the school. However, uh, if you developed a project that had uh, inter-student presentation, you would be going farther than most language teachers ever managed to go. Uh, and so you'd be getting closer to PBL, but you wouldn't be meeting that, that rigorous uh, descriptor. So it would be considered less ideal, I think. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, all of these questions that have been raised, I think, will be addressed as we go through our five modules. We're all just beginning uh, to get a taste of what this is. And so your patience is appreciated as we move on. And maybe you'll find your question answered very soon.